I'm Arsene Myers. Hope everyone is having a great day. Got some really interesting things to look at in the charts. I'm leaning bearish here. I think it's, it's quite obvious that we're going to have a move a little bit lower. So uh, I know a lot of us got absolutely wrecked with uh, some plays that we had set up in our trades. A lot of stop losses were taken out. And of course, you do that to manage your risk. So hopefully we're managing your risk. We have had a little bit of a rally back up, but I think that's a bit of a false rally. We're coming back up to retest the uh, support, which is now a resistance. So we generally see that, and that's where shorts actually come in because they know the market's confirmed a bit low. And I think we're seeing that on the daily candle. Let's just crack into the charts. I think um, Steve-O really helped call this uh, in his session yesterday when he was looking at the S&P 500. And I've put in the Discord just my methodology and on how I'm seeing this sort of play out. I'm also very conscious that I don't expect this to be a very long um, drop, as in I don't expect this to go too low. I expect this to sort of go into these zones of interest for mine. Um, and that is the uh, 20, 27.50 down to about 26.50. And the 50-day moving average is in that, that zone, which I'm very keenly watching. I'm also watching the second zone where we know the 200-week moving average sits at around about 25.500. Uh, so anything below 26.500, I think is a really, really um, strong area of value uh, to pick up some uh, some cheap Bitcoin there before we maybe move higher. Uh, also, a support level down here, 25,000. That level, I think, is going to be um, relatively hard to break. So I'm not that concerned about it. But um, what I put in, in fact, let's just let's quickly scoot on over to uh, the Discord. And let me just run through what I put here. And I, uh, I'll just sort of read through my thoughts because I hope you do read it. It's, it's kind of just my thinking around correlations and where they kind of sit in dynamics and I'm watching and I've put here gold versus S&P 500 versus Bitcoin. So the theme to this post was um, again around the dynamics and the, the potential downside with correlations. Um, so gold is actually back above 2000, which is really, really interesting. Uh, and it did look or does look this morning more uh, better than Bitcoin. In fact, it looks like it's just moving into uh, a rising channel, which Bitcoin had done for a while already. Uh, whereas gold's trying to you know move back up to the top of the channel. It's at the bottom now, but it's trying to move up um, uh, whereas Bitcoin's broke down. Now, you could look at this two ways that, you know, gold's getting a bid, obviously, um, and Bitcoin has been sort of correlating with gold uh, for the first time here, but has Bitcoin actually kind of got in front of gold now? It's kind of front run what's about to happen. And we're seeing weakness in stock. So thank you for Steve for pointing that out. I absolutely see what you're saying in terms of the double top. It really concerned me this morning when I was looking at um just how things were flowing. It looked like markets were just on edge. There was no real bullish momentum. I feel like we've parked the bus until May 14. Um, and, and that's just something to, to be aware of. And, you know, uh, sell in May and walk away. It's actually a saying in traditional finance because liquidity in this time of year really starts to trail off at the end of April. And potentially we're starting to front run that. And I think downside's absolutely on the cards, um, you know, into the future. And I don't want to scare you when I say downside, you know, I'm not talking about, you know, low 20,000s or anything. I'm talking about us having a nice measured pullback. Um, the other day, it might have felt a bit scary because of that that big 10% plus drop, uh, you know, from that 30,000 down to, you know, where, where we kind of are now. Um, but it was probably more pronounced in altcoins. And, and just what we've been saying, you know, for a long time is liquidity in the market is just not there. So when Bitcoin suddenly finds weakness and feels a bit of instability and altcoins are, you know, trying to, you know, have that season, that old season, blah, 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 without strong liquidity, as soon as Bitcoin shows that weakness, instability, it starts to roll back um, really, really hard. So altcoins just get crushed. It rolls into Bitcoin. So again, just some massive risks, just being in higher risk altcoins at the moment, if, if any, and just keeping towards that Bitcoin Ethereum allocation is just front of mind. Um, so just two thoughts here. Again, it has Bitcoin sprinted forward. Gold's now lagging and it's about to break down sort of thing. Um, or number two is Bitcoin now correcting more in line with S&P weakness and more traditional dynamics. And I think over time, we've seen Bitcoin correlates to something until it doesn't. And uh, all last year, it was tightly correlated to tech stocks, you know, to the downside. And this year has been more with gold, while S&P is kind of grinding up, going sideways. Whereas, you know, again, Bitcoin's outperformance has been really, really strong. So uh, what are we seeing now? I, I strongly suspect any major weakness in, in stocks, we see Bitcoin just follow it. And we just, we follow, we will follow liquidity flows. If liquidity is falling out of the S&P 500, um, then liquidity is going to fall out of Bitcoin. That, that's my honest um, thinking around that. Uh, and we do have to keep in mind as well that the VIX, 
um, on, on the charts, and maybe I can bring this up in a sec, but the VIX, the volatility index for the S&P 500, it's actually now at levels that it was at the height of the 2021 bull market and just before it had the real rip to the downside where the Fed started doing uh, its its QT and, and, and whatnot. So it does look like we are due for a bit of volatility in stocks. And just looking at the S&P 500 chart, it was pretty obvious to me, and I think Steve-O, again, called it so, so early um, that it was just here on this chart here, was forming this almost double top formation with momentum and strength falling over. And like Bitcoin, it has just fallen just below and closed below this trend here and about to, to roll to the downside. For mine, whenever I see this, I see that as a trader when I'm doing the shorter term stuff, I see that kind of action, a close beneath. I'm just like, I go into a short almost immediately or I wait for the, the press back up to test the underside. And that's what I'm going to show you guys uh, on the Bitcoin chart in a sec. Uh, that's exactly what I feel is playing out. Um, just give you some guidance around what levels I'm looking at uh, as well. Whenever we've breached the 20 EMA, we always, well, we tend to fall back towards the, the 50. So that's what I will um, we'll get on here. Uh, but yeah, read that. It's just got some more general thoughts. I'm going to go back to the charts because otherwise I'll, I'll get lost just talking about this all day. Um, and let me just use share and get back to the chart. Hopefully you can all see that. All right. Yeah, cool. So um, again, just to illustrate my point here, this is the daily close. For me, this is so ugly. Um, I can't tell you. So we're holding at 8,200. I think I said to you guys yesterday that, you know, if we hold, I'm still bullish if we're at, you know, 28,800, something like that up here on that fib and also on top of this channel. But it has broken through. We lost 28,800. We've closed beneath it. We're now beneath this trend line. I can absolutely see a bit. Uh, and I think maybe we saw a little bit this morning. We have a bit of a rally, but generally, um, with these patterns, we tend to see a bit of a rally, gets everyone a bit excited again, test the underside of that um, uh, support now, flip resistance, about 2% up. So up here about 28,800, we could test that, we'll get to 28,700. And then then we fall over, we have the real um, roll over here. But I don't know, momentum here looks pretty, pretty bad in that uh, it just looks straight down on the daily. Uh, and if I uh, roll into just a moving average here, let's just go, um, let's go exponential. So 20 exponential slash... Uh, moving average in relatively the same spot um, that I looked at before. So we just go with the 20 and I'll show you. Um, so the blue here, whenever we've lost the 20 uh, on the daily, you can just see here, we've, we've generally you know lost it in, in the uptrend style. We, we have come back up, but we're drifting towards that 50. When we lost it over here, when we wanted that big correction, we came back down, hit the 50 almost immediately, and then you know blasted through it once we had the correction. Um, we've been riding above the 20 for a long while, haven't been able to breach it. Now we've breached it here. The 50 is looming down here at 26,500. That's what has me very interested, potentially to, to whack into it or go through it a little bit more to, you know, 25, uh, 500, 25, you know, high 2500s to get everyone a bit, little bit scared. Um, for mine, this just looks so weak. I, I, yeah, it's it's just too short for me. Of course, this could reverse. A bit of craziness could just see us dip in here and then and, and punch straight back up. And then maybe that's the case. But I fully expect this to kind of play out, you know, something like this. Uh, and then we, you know, go higher, very similar to what's happened over here. Um, but May is going to be a very interesting month. And we're going to run into May 14th, the uh, Federal Reserve uh, interest rate rise. And again, I think we're just going to put the queue in the rack for a little while here. And the, the bias will be to the downside as liquidity leaks out. People just want to just sit on the back and wait potentially for a pause. Um, or um, or another rate rise, which of course can get a pause. I think markets are going to you know move a little bit higher. But for mine, what's happened sort of through this area here is markets trying to price in that pause early. So uh, whether we get major volatility, I still think we do. I still think we get an upwards tick um, on a pause. Uh, but if we get a rate rise, I think you know these lower um, levels, you know twenty four five hundred, twenty five hundred is absolutely on the cards. We just don't want to close beneath the, the 200 week moving average. And that's um, very much on, on my thinking there. All right. Um, and just, I want to pull us back to uh, the weekly chart because um, I was looking at this with with a colleague of mine and we were just thinking about the, the longer term, the bigger picture. And, and for us, we were looking at the weekly and yeah, we we're kind of ex hoping or expecting, and that's where you can get a bit of, in a bit of trouble here that we're going to have that that can just one more pop up, just maybe 31, 32, and then and then we see maybe like a bearish divergence on the weekly or, or something like that. Um, but it just didn't didn't kind of eventuate. And and what we were seeing here on the momentums is it, it and we're at a, a high time frame resistance. So you can clearly see that 30,000 is high time frame resistance, massive resistance. 
and we hadn't actually breached through it. We were just stuck underneath it. Meanwhile, stock RSI on the weekly was topping out. We saw a crossover over here. Uh, we also saw RSI rolling over. Uh, there was another one as well. So, actually, where does the 20 end up? 24,400. That's really interesting on the weekly. That could be a really interesting spot. So, yeah, all of these are kind of lining up. you got the 25,848 at the 200-week moving average. So, yeah, this area looks like diamond area to buy uh, if it does get there. I just thought I'd throw that out there, guys. Um, now, what was I doing? Yes, I need to get rid of one of these and then add in momentum. Yeah. Um, okay. Momentum doesn't look terrible there. It's just kind of going sideways. So that's fine. But in the short term, this just looks like it wants to cool off. It just, if things need to, get, the heat needs to get taken out. And I also looked at the funding rates this morning and they're actually starting to tick. Um, not in the manner we want. It looks like people are actually trying to long this drop that we've just had. So that's a really bad sign um, that we don't even have that kind of fuel for us to have that short squeeze to just rip us to the upside. Uh, it's clear that you know people are kind of FOMOing in to long this 10% drop uh, when we kind of wanted shorts to really pile in. We wanted funding to go negative, and it's just it's not there. It's it's still kind of neutral to trending towards you know longs coming on board. So uh, I still think this needs to get flushed a little bit lower. Um, and there's there's no harm in that. That's perfectly healthy. We weren't just going to go straight up. We're always going to have you know some um, action coming back at some point towards this area here. Um, and it's just, it depends on how deep it is. And I, I still feel in the back of my mind, it is a, a little bit like 2019, where we do kind of expect that perfect entry, that perfect buy zone, you know, 25,500, 200 week moving average or 26,000, um, but it only gets, you know, 27,200 or something. It doesn't give everyone that chance to move in at that perfect level. Um, and, and that all being said, we could absolutely hold here, 28,000, uh, yeah, 28,220, if we just zoom in, it could absolutely hold this, this area and we might look back. Could be a bit of a fake out, a bit of a tease. Everyone has these orders down below. You know, I mean, four hour looks okay. This is what has me really uh, keen and vigilant for this. And this is that trend line I had. Keen and vigilant for this this move higher. Uh, it moved back as a, as a, you know, a hit above and then a fall over. So it would look something like this. Exactly like that. And it kind of happened over here a little bit, how we had the drop, but then the rally back up and then the kick back down. But now we're below, you know, this is the four hours, this is the 200 on the four hour. We're below that, it could definitely come up and retest. So the shorter term timeframes are sort of showing that there is a bit of a, a appetite for a, a bounce here back above. It doesn't mean that it's going to be that that's, um, significant bounce that we're looking for. It's just It just looks like this needs to find a floor um, and it's just not quite there yet. That's just my feeling around it. Um, so yes, definitely short-term bearish is my uh, my inclination. Tristan will be absolutely happy. So um, uh, there you go. Uh, uh, let's have a look at um, some other crypto. So Bitcoin will be leading this, of course, uh, whatever it does. But let's just have a look over at Ethereum if it looks any different. Uh, or uh, oh, let's see. So yeah, Ethereum four hour a little bit. I think that looks even better. So the RSI bottoming out, momentum ticking up, RSI uh, stock is looking really good. So this could absolutely come back up to 2000 test underside as well. Um, so again, it, it doesn't look terrible on the, the one hour, or the four hour and whatnot. It's just those high time frames that really give me pause that tell me that we're, um, regardless of this next 24, 48 hours, is we're probably this week, we're going to pull back into a consolidation range, maybe between you know, 27,000, 28. 1,800 sort of area. Um, so just keep that in the back of your mind. Litecoin as well, pretty disappointing that it ripped through all these areas quite significantly. I know that took out a couple of my stops. It was really frustrating. Um, and it got lower than I think you, you would expect. And that's kind of what it does to you. And it just blitzed through that pattern and didn't look back. So pretty uh, pretty good wreckage here uh, for everyone. But again, this is the four hour. This looks actually really good uh, for a move up, but still if Bitcoin has that instability to the downside, a lot of these altcoins are going to get, you know, crushed a little bit lower. Um, so I think, you know, $85 for Litecoin is probably around about the mark, you know, 87, 86, 85, all really good areas. And then you've got that, that big, you know, Hail Mary, stink bid 82. I don't know if that gets there, but if Bitcoin falls down to 26 or 27, it probably would. So um, just keep that in mind. Um, another one is the dollar. So if the S&P has, in fact, let's go to the S&P 500. And this is, I looked at this morning, like I said, guys, and 
I just did not like what I was seeing. Um, just just visibly, and sometimes you can look at a chart and just not like it. It didn't look at all good to me. And I, uh, yeah, uh, Steve, I did his analysis here, and that that woke me up. But here, oh, it's doing exactly what uh, I'm sort of explaining before: is it's trying to come back underneath, test it as um, resistance, and then it falls lower. So I've just got the arrow here just to show you that. See the stock RSI just bleeding off. Uh, momentum, you know, it's not looking terrible yet. It's trying to snake up, but you know, this could easily curl away. RSI is falling away. So momentum to keep this price action up here under resistance is going to be very, very tough. Uh, and it could start to lose these levels quite quickly. And this this area down here, probably the 50 is the likeliest place, you know, um, four, low 4,000 and down here. If this happens, then Bitcoin will get hit. That's just my feeling. Um, so yeah, that's how we do it. And if the stocks get hit um, and all that, I think the dollar here could have a, a reasonable shot at rallying. I think the sentiment low for the dollar is almost in. I have not seen enough um, evidence. Uh, sorry, I've seen so much evidence of that. It's not funny with the dollar going to zero, you know, bricks coming out, the dollar of the global reserves dead. I mean, when you start to see that, just think about if you started to see all that stuff with Bitcoin again at the all-time high uh, or Bitcoin at the low, you know, you, you, things coming out in all publications, you know, Bitcoin's dead for the 1500th time. It's over, no use case, you know, it's finally going to zero. We're seeing all that. And then it rallied from 15 thousand to you know 30 where it is close to now um the dollar i think its death has been just totally overblown it is not based in reality whatsoever it is still the medium of exchange for the world um it's the u.s treasuries which is the possible issue that you know that, that global collateral might get slowly over time replaced u.s dollar uh, it's still the the most used currency on earth for um you know trade for debt issuance for paying off debt or um, cross-border exchanges. So let's let's not drink the bathwater. I think that's that's probably the case. And just look at it for what it is. And you know, it, as soon as some of these central banks in the DXY index, like the European Central Bank and whatnot, start to um, maybe trail off what they're doing with these um, serious rate rises, and if the if the Fed comes out uh, on May and it starts to come out that you know inflation is going to be hot, you know, stickier for a bit longer, which there's every chance they're just going to throw in another 0.25 in my eyes. I mean, futures markets keep flipping and maybe we shouldn't look at them too much. I do a lot. And it just it last month because of the bank crisis was showing cuts were essentially coming almost imminently. A pause was almost a certainty. And now the futures markets, because the bank crisis seems to have been, you know, they've, they've plugged the holes uh, with their fingers and, and more liquidity, things seem to have stabilised. And it's sort of very visible that the banks aren't just going to go under. You know, everything's now socialised. They're all going to get bailed out at some point in time. Um, so once that's passed, yeah, it's, it's it's very, very interesting. So now the futures markets are pricing, uh, you know, a, a higher probability now of another 0.25. So you just have to kind of play this dynamic and see where it lies. I mean, it's going on a lot longer than I thought possible, which is fine. I'm just um sometimes you get you get the read wrong um but here with the dollar if they raise that 0.25 and surprise everyone and again other central banks sort of either pause it is i know the rba in, this, in australia is you know sort of putting things on hold now too the dxy is going to rally and we're seeing here on the daily this is a a very clear bullish divergence where prices actually made um a, a lower low here but the um the momentum on the rsi is actually climbing so that that's a bullish divergence there's every chance the dollar has a rally here back to 103. And again, that can put the cat amongst the pigeons with uh, with stock markets, with crypto and all that. And I just don't see, I don't see this holding up um, in, in the interim. I just think we want to have a bit more of a move back into liquidity a little bit lower. Um, what else did I want to show you? Yeah, gold, we saw that. Yields, how are they looking? Well, that's interesting. So this is really good. I, I'm going to um, actually just point this out. So... Um, and I put it in my latest newsletter if you hadn't read it. So the like the dollar going to zero narrative as well, the the recessions not happening, soft landing, you know, all this crap. I'm just not buying it. I'm not buying it. And I don't think the market's buying it either now. Um, it, we're seeing a, an obvious slowdown in the US economy. We're seeing layoffs continue to, to start creeping up. Unemployment or employment was the last sort of metric that the Fed kind of look at or just every onlookers look at to tell you whether um, the US or our country is heading into a recession. It's often the last metric to fall over before you're in a full-blown recession. They have to sort of look at pivoting and whatnot. And up until now, the US economy has looked really resilient, but it's starting to show signs of weakness. So 
um, again, we're heading towards this this yield curve inversion. I often talk about how the the shorter end of the the bond yield curve is percentage points higher than the longer end, so the the ten years and whatnot tells you that smart money is moving into those longer end bonds because they're they're anticipating that they're calling the Fed's bluff. They're saying, well, we don't believe you. We we think we're heading into harder economic times and possibly a recession. So we're buying these longer end bonds because um, we think they're good value. We want to put our money where we think it's going to be safe, kind of risk-free for the longest period of time. And the 10-year the here, the yield is now starting to break down. This is on the day. This is the 200. This is a very interesting chart. This could really fall down and fall down hard, rolling over, rolling over, rolling over. So uh, yeah, money going into bonds is a pretty good sign that... Um, uh, and the bond market is just a sign of health, really, uh, that the US is slowly winding into a recession. So this does put that cap again on the, the rate rises that they're going to do. So maybe another 0.25, maybe a pause, you just don't know, depending on what metrics they're looking at now. But inflation, absolutely cooling. But now it's just this rolling game of, you know, it's going to happen, it will it won't. So yeah, that's how I see it. Now you would think in that environment, again, gold should get a bid. So it's still up at that 2000. This to me, you know, it's I reckon this is going to, I reckon it's going to close down. That's just looking at it. I'm just looking at it then. Um, sorry, I'm just trying to think through this, guys, because I was looking at this this morning. And I thought, geez, gold's having a bit of a move up here. Um, but then I looked at Bitcoin in a pretty similar pattern and it's already front run gold almost a little bit. So Bitcoin, say, down here uh, and now trying to, you know, make that that move lower, whereas gold is about to, or trying to break through here. Yeah, that looks a little bit. Mm, doesn't look too great for gold. So yeah, um, and again, you think that gold and Bitcoin should get that bid into the recession, but right now, if if, if there's any thoughts of you know pivot, if we're put, priced in a, a pause, and then the markets are now starting to think of a recession and a pivot, we know that markets really hate that, and we might have that you know downwards move. It's just sort of yeah, again, state and flux. Gonna have to play it by ear and, and keep on top of these metrics and see where it all, all lies, but. Um, yeah, that's where I kind of see things, guys. So please be very careful in altcoins at the moment as well. Um, you can play, manage your risk, absolutely, but try and keep it a bit tight, I'd say, uh, because things could roll over very, very quickly. This is what I was talking about before, the um, sell in May and go away. And the stocks definitely, if it hadn't have, you know, made that new high that, you know, see what Steve was talking about, we've got those two rounded heads, if it hadn't pushed above that second one and on a bit of volume and a, a bit of momentum, then it, it really does set things up that the market is pricing in potentially a quieter May um, and also with obvious macro overheads with the Fed doing their thing, which could obviously bring in volatility. It does seem like we're pricing in a quieter month and, and things are starting to sell off a little bit here, which is very, very interesting. But May has traditionally have been um, poor months for performance. There's just generally less liquidity. I'm not 100% why that is. Um, and there probably is a reason, but I just want to bring that up to you guys as well, that you know things are just lining up for it to be uh, a a red month, oh, sorry, not a red month, a, a red week um, coming up and then probably another red week into, yeah, the Fed 14th and we're going to see after that. Uh, this is very interesting news with all the regulatory climate stuff. Uh, Coinbase gets Bermuda license plans to launch offshore exchange in the coming weeks and this is hot on the heels of Gary Gensler getting absolutely eviscerated in front of uh, Congress and the GOP-led Financial Services Committee. Um, there are, of course, many Democrats in favour of Gensler, like Elizabeth Warren and, and a few others like Brad Sherman and, and whatnot. But it was very, very obvious that um, innovation, crypto companies and all that has been relatively shoved outside of the United States to go over there. And I, I, I um, and this is maybe my contrarian hat on here, I feel like when, you, when you're assessing trends and, and seeing things move, um, this is really obvious. And I, I think maybe we're heading towards a peak uh, peak anti-crypto in the United States, um, whereas we kind of reach a tipping point where one side, you know, has it one way for a long while, which I think um, the sort of the Democrat anti-crypto lobby is really had its own way for a while here after FTX. And I think we're starting to see the pushback uh, against because we're seeing tangible downsides of uh, the other side movements here in that major companies like Coinbase are looking to move overseas um, stable coins can't get regulated. You know, people are losing their jobs. You know, heading in towards a recession. This, this impacts jobs, and uh, and yeah, I, I think it's it's very very interesting to watch whether this is this is it. And I know we're heading into a, a political cycle. And I'll just get to that in a second. In fact, let's just do that now. Um, if you're not following this, do because I think there's a seismic shift happening in the United States in the political system, and and the same with Trump when he came along. I think 
he shook up the Republican Party, um, turned it away from many uh, more traditional values that it had and made it more populous uh, and, and whatnot. But, you know, he is incredibly popular and he was a disruptor. He shook the status quo. I don't agree with, you know, half the stuff he did or, or said, but, you know, you could recognise some things he was trying to do and uh, also the huge voter base that supported him. They they all feel left behind. They feel like their country has moved in a direction they don't like and they feel unheard. And I think this here, um, Robert F. Kennedy Jr., I brought him up the other day. Uh, he's got the name, he's got the pedigree, and he's got this disruptive streak about him that is very similar to Trump, but a bit more in line with maybe um, uh, certainly myself in terms of the more centrist uh, point of view. Um, and, again, he he will run the rings around the current Democratic leadership if he gets a, an ear in, if he gets into the... This is the problem, though. He's going to go up against Biden in the, the established Democratic field, um, and whether he gets, you know, the votes to be that, he's going to have to really start. Um, well, I don't know how he's going to do it because he's going to have to really beat out the current establishment. Trump did it. Uh, Robert F. Kennedy, can, I think, has a reasonable shot at doing it because he's got the name. He's got the um, legitimacy in a way and he's got that that legacy about him. And I think Democrats, especially in the centre, are just crying out for change. America's crying out for change. It's sort of this... Uh, he actually really appeals to a lot of Republicans in the base as well. So he's a really interesting candidate. And we know how, I guess, deeply unpopular Biden has become. We know how deeply unpopular Trump is uh, on, you know, one side of America as well. So there kind of needs to be an in-between. And I think this guy might be, and he has got a, a really bad rap. And you just don't know these days in the media. He's got a very bad rap for you know, being quite, quite anti-vaxxer and whatnot. But from what I've seen, um, we can all be more sceptical about, you know, big corporations, big pharma, um, and and how we conduct ourselves um, that way. But why I'm bringing this up as well, not only is this made this represent a massive political shift, but he is a pro-Bitcoiner, pro-crypto, very outspoken as well. He's going to get on the circuit. He's going to campaign. He's going to have debates against Biden. He's going to be up there in everyone's grill saying X, Y, and Z. This is going to put things back on centre stage. And if he becomes president, all this stuff goes away, essentially, depending on what the you know Congress and Senate looks like, but it would be a far more positive environment for crypto and Bitcoin if he gets in or at least is on the trail because a lot of these people that are doing a lot of anti-crypto policy is going to have to start really explaining themselves. Um, and already you're seeing legislation put in to remove Gensler. So there's kind of this, I think we're at that that peak, peak anti-crypto phase in the United States. It's going to be fine broadly because it's all being pushed outside of the United States where actually crypto and Bitcoin are doing actual tangible real world good. Right now, there's a tremendous amount of financial privilege in the United States. A lot of people just don't recognize what this shift is and what it can do. But things like El Salvador and what's going on there, um, you know, it's just absolutely wild. But I wanted to put Robert F. Kennedy on your um, on your agenda or just in the back of your mind, he released this campaign video, which is actually quite stirring because I, I'm a bit of a traditionalist myself. I I, I love history and I, I really um, uh, was a fan in, in respect of um, uh, his brothers and his fathers, um, it was the whole Kennedy family when they were in, um, they were, they were, um, Robert Kennedy was president and whatnot. I mean, he's Robert Kennedy Jr. So yeah, it's, it's kind of like this romantic story where it sort of all comes full circle after the tragedies that, you know, um, uh, Kennedy was assassinated. And then I think it was his brother or his father, uh, that, that this is Robert Kennedy Jr.'s father or brother. I think he was, um, no, no, father. He was killed uh, in a plane crash, I think. There was, it's almost like a, the Kennedy curse I've heard it described as. And there's many books written on it. And I do think that they were disruptors even in their times and went, went against the corruption and mainstream establishment. There's a you know, fair, a, a fair amount of evidence now that the CIA actually killed President Kennedy themselves for, for different reasons. And um, you know, that's still conjecture and it's very speculative. But this where there's smoke, there's generally a little bit of fire. Um, so again, this is hugely disruptive. Um, and uh, yeah, the Democrats need to shake up anyway. They've gone a little bit too woke. You know, and I say a little bit, I'm being a bit generous there. They've gone a little bit off the reservation and they're doing a lot of things that, um, yeah, aren't, aren't really in line with a, a free democratic society and a, a capitalist society for one at that. Now, this is my view. And I, this is coming from someone, I'm I'm very vanilla, I'm very centre, but I do not like what is kind of happening um, in politics um, globally right now. And it's just looking really shaky when the West is, up against it, we're heading into a period of authoritarians. We're heading into a period likely um, that's going to feature 
tremendous amount of conflict, whereas in Russia and Ukraine, essentially we're in a de facto World War Three. Uh, and, you know, when China finally decides to go for Taiwan, we'll be there. So, um, yeah, it's interesting times. Um, Robert F. Kennedy Jr., make sure to have a look what he's doing and uh, his, his pro-crypto stance. He's very much free markets, very much, uh, you know, liberty, flourish, freedoms, all that. So very, very fascinating candidate. To go in the Democratic field is a, probably a game changer because he's going up against Biden, who is, is having a lot of trouble cognitively right now. Uh, and uh, Robert F. Kennedy will run circles around him. So it's going to be fascinating. I don't know if he's actually going to, there, there might be something before he gets up on stage or Biden won't do debates or whatnot. It will be, again, very, very fascinating. Okay. And uh, one last thing, guys, I just want to share is, uh, yeah, AI. So um, I put in the macro trends that, you know, I put out on a Tuesday just to keep an eye on AI, um, because it's just plastered all over the news now. And this, this is probably less a priority now um, because Bitcoin is showing that instability. Altcoins are just going to get smashed left, right and centre. But when Bitcoin does find that low, please be mindful that AI, I think, is going to get another really big bounce where we see tremendous gains. Uh, AI, again, is in the news a lot. And Musk here is talking about how it's has the potential to be incredibly damaging for humanity, if not um, civilization altering in a negative way. Um, and, and you can watch all this, but AI again is in all the news, all the tech companies are developing their own AIs. We are going to get another AI boom at some point. And had we, you know, broken through 30,000, I think AI would have powered really, really hard based on all this kind of stuff. And I want to point out that while you think it might be negative, I think any news is good news um, for a narrative, especially in crypto. It's being talked about. People are taking interest in it. They're looking into how they can invest in it um, and all that. So, guys, I hope you've uh, enjoyed this episode. So, yeah, just to maybe or maybe I should summarize these episodes a little bit better as well so you have maybe some takeaways. So I'm fully expecting a pullback if we just go back to um, Bitcoin uh, to the I kind of want it to pull back now. I'm in that zone. I've got bids lower. I, I just I don't care about the, the, all the shorter term trades are closed out. Oh my goodness, I've got to stop closing. Uh, but yeah, to summarize, I think we're going down to that um, that 50 moving average at around about 26, 800, let's say. Yeah, let's let's really call that. And you know, if we're really in a really bad mode or things really start to roll over, we're probably going back to 25,000. And I think we could get a bit of a scare. If this is really vicious, there could be a, a scare like a wick beneath 25,000 or the 200 week moving average to put the willies up everyone and get them to panic sell. And that's when you get that real capitulation where all the derivatives get, excuse me, flushed out and we get a nice reset. Exactly like what we happened here um, back at the 200 day moving average. So many people just, you know, panic sold, capitulated there and then we ran up to 30,000. So uh, keep that in mind, guys, um, and also watch the broader macro sphere for more um, information. I'll keep you updated as well. Have a wonderful day, and we'll catch you again next week. Bye. -bye.